You are listening to the Wi-Fi Ninjas podcast, where we talk about wireless technology. Here are your hosts, Mac Daring and Matt Starling. Hey everyone, welcome to the Wi-Fi Ninjas podcast. Matt and Mac here, and today we are joined with a very nice guy called Mr. Nicholas Darchis. Did I say that? Did I pronounce that right? Yes, yes. So if you have to say it with a French posh accent, it's Nicolas Darchi, but Nicolas anything Darchi. is fine with me. Like I go by Nico because it's easier in an international environment, but uh, yeah, anything's fine. Okay, perfect. I'll, well, I'll stick to Nico then. Uh, Nico, thank you very much for joining us on our podcast today. Do you just want to introduce yourself a little bit and give everyone a bit of a background about yourself? Yeah, so um, I'm from Belgium. So I work for Cisco Tech in Belgium. Um, I'm from Belgium originally, one of the, the rare ones in Cisco because it's a really diverse team and, and diverse environment. Um, I joined Cisco at the age of 22. I was barely a kid. Uh, I had no idea of wireless. I uh, barely had my CCNA in the sense that I actually had to take it several times to, to get it, and it was about to expire. Uh, I didn't believe I could get hired at Cisco, but I did. So uh, that was a good surprise for me. Uh, the good thing is I was with a lot of other new grads and a lot of uh, younger guys, even though I was the youngest. Um, and I thought to myself, you know what, this sounds like a very interesting job. Like uh, I'm going to get a lot of experience out of it and I'm going to learn a lot. But it's probably a crazy house, like, you know, call center, uh, that kind of support, like two years only. And then I'm out. And now it's been 13 years, nearly 14. And I'm, I'm still there, actually, and not planning on moving. So, yeah, so I still look like a kid pretty much to me. So 22 <laughs> years, like 13 years ago. So we are the same age. Yeah, we're all kids still, guys. So yeah, yeah nice, nice. I'm actually trying to grow a beard just to look a bit older because it, everyone keep asking me like, you know, are you 20? Are you 22? So I have that kind of issue. So now I need to kind of try to look like a man, but it doesn't grow so much. So <laughs> okay, you, find, you find it challenging to buy a, uh, buy a beer in the market. <laughs> how, how come do you have a French name? Uh, because I'm French speaking, so I'm from Belgium. There's like two languages, so you're either French speaking or Dutch speaking. And okay, the name doesn't have too much, but I'm from the French speaking region. Okay, interesting to know. So you have been in Cisco for the last 13 years. That's hell of a long time. So this was like your first real job. Yes, my you... first and only, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I had a student job, but that doesn't really count. Amazing. So you started as a as a graduate with your CCNA that you had to uh, attempt to pass more than once so welcome to the club i think it took me like three attempts uh first time to pass it how about you matt how many attempts uh it, yeah i definitely Probably. definitely didn't pass first time uh i can't remember if it was the second or the third time um, it was quite a long time ago now when i took my cc name it must be like seven eight years maybe even longer but i i know 100 percent didn't pass first time quite a lot of my cisco exams i didn't pass the first time it's usually the second time Usually, yeah. what I usually do is like you, you take the exam and then you kind of know the areas that you need to work on and then you can go away, work on those areas and then I generally find when you come back and you pass. Yeah, there we go. So a tip from Matt, uh, you don't have to learn the material. You just go to the exam center more than once, <laughs> learn the questions and then learn how to answer them. And there we go. You are a certified wireless engineer. Uh, that you... works for school and university as well, but uh, it's, it's just a longer process, right? Yeah, well, you, you need to kind of get your head around and used to how Cisco emulator uh, labs in the exams especially for the um the wireless ones when i was doing my ccmp wireless ones and uh, you got to try and click for an error as controller but not all of the buttons work and figuring out what pops up and what you need to configure where so getting your head around that and knowing what to expect is kind of like half the uh, half the battle same for me actually for the, the ccie like i had to try it I, I was confident i would pass it first attempt and it, it just didn't happen so <laughs> You think you know, but then, you know, just the exam and the type of questions and, and just the speed you have to, to have is, is, yeah, you have to work on that. So. It's either you, you know it or you don't know it, right? You don't have time to go back or you, you even can go back to your questions, can you? Uh, typically, no, you cannot. But yeah. with, the, uh, with the lab, I suppose. Yeah, well. lab, yeah, it's, yeah, it's an eight-hour lab. So that's actually the catch because you think, oh, I'll have time to do this later. And then you think you'll come back, but you never do. And then you, you forget one part. And it's uh, you need organization skills. And the people I know who actually got it first time, they're extremely organized and much better at studying than I am. So uh -huh. it's, it's a matter of organizing skill, I think. Where did you take your CCIE lab? Because I know there's only a few places where you can actually do it. You can't... Well, in Brussels, it's yeah. like just, you know, it's where I work. So. Quite, <laughs> you quite have two convenient. buildings uh, in Cisco Brussels, and one is like the sales and CCIE building, and then the tech building is just next to it. 
yeah. sort of like going going for work like uh, regular nice they do some pop-up ones well they used to i know they used to have lots of like pop-up ccie labs around but i'm not sure too many of those are happening at the moment yeah i don't know about that like it, it was frozen for a whole year i think now they, they're resuming the the, the labs but uh, yeah yeah what is the um uh kind of like position with cisco at the moment i know they kind of like if you had an exam that was expiring they got be got like extended by a, a, a few months but is that still the case or uh, i think autom- everyone got automatically extended uh even up to a year i think uh, i i know i got extended for up to a year um and and that's about it i think it was automatic good gives us another <laughs> bit longer before we need to think about renewing some of our exams in yeah yeah definitely and i think when it, it fully reopens everyone will just jump on it as soon as i mean there's less travel restrictions so it's going to be it's going to be busy I bet. So, what what is um what is life like then as a as a Cisco tech engineer? Uh, busy. <laughs> so, um, just the, the basic way it works. Uh, we have eight hours shift at least in in Europe because we're a bit in the in the middle of of, of everything. Um, so we work shifts from eight in the morning to four p.m. and that's Brussels time. Um, we actually have another tax centers in Krakow and one in Lisbon now, so they have like maybe one hour difference, but otherwise it's it's at the same time. Uh, and that's time you have to be there and ready to take new cases. So anytime someone opens a low severity, we call it severity three, uh, you have 15 minutes, 20 minutes to take it and, and then an hour to send an initial contact email. And if it's a high severity because the network is down, uh, it's a matter of, of five to, to 10 minutes. Um, yeah, I've, so I've you, definitely... you have to be there and like on yeah. it. So yeah. even if you go and grab a coffee, you might miss your SLA. Exactly. So that's why we have uh, strict organization skills, like depending on the team size. Uh, larger teams, they can afford to have uh, different groups, a, a group in the morning, another group during the afternoon so that you have, you know, at least half of the day where you could go for a coffee, you could talk with a colleague, etc. Other teams, they're too small, so they just like all day on shift. Uh, we try to have like a shift order, so you know the next case is for that guy. Um, at least that's how it works in the wireless team. And then if you're next, like really don't really leave your your desk. Uh, if there's two three engineers before you in the order, then you you know going for a coffee is probably okay. But you just check on your phone if 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 there's something coming. So wow, many... I will feel bad every time I I log a tag case now. Uh-huh. Oh. <laughs> don't. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's it's just a, a matter of habit, so it's it's really fine. So how many how many people are in your in your team then, Nicholas or Nico in your wireless team? Uh, around ten. So we actually got a couple extra. So I don't know the exact count. I would say maybe twelve right now. But we always revolve around around ten in Brussels. Um, that is, I would say, not a good picture of the the whole team size, uh, because we have outsourcing in in Jordan and there are around forty engineers there. So you have ten engineers in Brussels and and forty in Jordan. And uh, it's pretty much the, the same in other teams. You have uh, you have several locations, and now we're we're having a few guys in in Lisbon as well for for wireless. Yeah, I mean, just speaking from experience, when I've raised Cisco attack cases, depending on the time of the day, uh, you'll end up speaking to someone in Lisbon, and then you know the next morning you need to have your um, case reassigned to a European engineer, probably one of yourselves in your team. I think we've I think I've already spoken to people in your team quite a few times. Yeah. So technically if you open after four PM, it goes to the America's time zone. So mm. that could be uh RTP North Carolina, that could be Mexico, uh or or one of their outsourcing centers as well. So you don't really control where it goes, but depending on the time, there's a certainty. If it's after four PM Brussels time and actually that's three PM in the UK so a lot of UK customers, if they open after the middle of the afternoon, they, they go to the US time zone, they have to come back the next day. Mm. So you say that when a uh, case gets raised, it's, give, it's given a priority by a severe case size from one to three. Is there anything else that affects the um, priority of cases like at Natilic, we're a gold partner. Does that mean that we are more likely to get through and have a, a attack engineer quicker than maybe someone that's not got such a high level partner status or does that not affect it? Uh, not really. So the customer is the one defining the severity. So if uh, even you're you're a small customer, but you have a severity one, your network is down. Uh, that is that is exactly the same. Um, so you have other advantages by being a, a gold partner. Um, you can open high severity cases 
uh, via the web. You don't need to call in. Uh, normally, uh, a regular customer needs to, to call in and provide some, some contract details, so you can skip some entitlement. There's uh, definitely extra advantages, but um, severity is defined by the customer, and we just have to follow it. Uh, if people generally don't abuse it, uh, and, and I hear some people saying, oh, TAC always wants to reduce the severity. The only reason behind it is that if it's a high severity, we have to work on it, but we expect the customer as well. So if the network is down, like we expect, you know, uh, we'll have to hand over to the to the next theater when we go off shift, uh, and and there's going to be a handover, and we're going to keep working. Or exceptionally, if not tomorrow morning, we we'll resume. If you say, oh, it's a network down, but you know, oh, I'm going to get the logs, and it's going to take me one week, then is it really a network down? So that's why tech engineers are uncomfortable, like to leave high severities. Then they're not meaningful. If everyone leave a high severity in their backlog, for for no reason. Yeah, that's, but that's you know, thing. if you're a customer, everything's a high high severity one for you, right? That's so every customer is like, oh my God, the same's not working, sev one. It happens. Some people say, you know, oh, I don't know how to configure this. And they say the network is down. And you're like, okay, how many people are affected? Well, 2,000. You're like, oh, 2,000. And you, you realize it's a new setup. And yeah, yeah, but we're going to deploy wireless for 2,000 people. It's not set up yet. But yeah, of course, it's down because it's not set up yet. Okay, okay. Uh, so um, obviously COVID affected lots of people and teams and companies around the world, but how did it affect, you know, your, the tech engine? I used to work in a support team when I first, when I first started working in Wi-Fi, that's how I cut my teeth was in support. But I used to, you know, I used to sit around, I, I used to be in like the first tier. So like, you know, just answering the calls, down through the basics, have you switched it off, switched it back on, other lights on sort of thing, and then work my way up to, you know, le higher levels of support. But I could just turn around and, you know, someone call in and say, I've got this problem. I could say, oh, let me see if I can fix it. Ask the person next to me, ask the person behind me, ask someone in the other uh, support team that's maybe like a next level up from what we are and, you know, just bounce some ideas off of them and, and get some help. But I presume you're all working from home. Like, how do you how do you guys manage that? Uh, that's, uh, yeah. It's uh, it's comfortable to work from home, right? At the beginning, the first month, you're really happy about it because there's no travel. And you know, when you live in a big city, it's, it's always more comfortable to stay home. Uh, but then it, it really gets on your nerve, right, after a few months. So right now, it's it's becoming a bit heavy. Um, we already had uh, a backup plan. Like if there was any issue in the office, we have to keep, you know, the business needs to keep running uh, because it's, it's critical. So we all had a CVO router, like a, a small Cisco ISR router with a phone at home and, and uh, a DX80 even. Um, so we could take shifts from home. And, and that was not a problem. In, in, if there's a problem in the office or if sometimes you have an appointment, you know, and, and you need to to be a bit more flexible and then you can you can just work from home from, from time to time. So we were always ready and it was really not a big problem to send everyone home. Uh, we do have collaboration tools. Uh, of course, the Cisco ones. Uh, so it's on the paper, it's fine, but it's really another another way of working uh, because in the office you have people, you know, they see you and you just ask what's up and oh, I, you know, I have this tough case. What do you think about? And you start a conversation that you would not have started normally. And when you have to rely on on instant messaging, people really have to ping you like, hey, Nico, I have this case. Can you please check it? Some people do it. Uh, some don't. So it, it's up to the seniors and, and myself here for the wireless team to really ping the guys like, hey, uh, is everything all right with you? You know, what is hot that you have and, and you're working on this week and, you know, anything I can help with? Um, you, you need to create this conversation. It's not natural. You really need to, to go for it. So that's, to me, the biggest difficulty. And, and the lab, like for wireless, the lab is just, uh, it's insane to do remote, right? Do you have it at home? The lab? <clears throat> yes. Yes. A small one. Okay, so let's let's spend a second talking about that. What access point do you have in production, and what staff do you have in your lab? Um, what do you mean in, in production? So what do you well, use? What do you use at home for your Wi-Fi? Yeah. So I have refurbished thirty-seven hundreds um, for my home uh, Wi-Fi, so they're rock solid. I'm happy with them. Uh, I have tried to use them for lab as well, but that didn't go well with the rest of my family, right? I have kids and they like to play online and, and you know, if there's any glitch, I get, I get instant feedback. Uh, so how can the uh, Wi-Fi be bad here when you're a Wi-Fi engineer or a tech person? Yeah, don't be, worry, we've all heard it. Because I change the settings on a daily basis to test configurations. <laughs> if I don't change, it's just perfect. At least you have wireless sensors without having to have a DNA sensor at home. Yeah, I have living sensors. It's crazy. Voice controlled. 
Um, yeah, so that that's I have two two APs for my house. Uh, I actually hooked them up on a 9800 controller in the cloud. Um, so it's it's production, it's not lab. Uh, but at what, least what do you, you know, mean by what do you mean by cloud, Nicholas? Amazon Web Service. Okay, so it is actually in the cloud. You haven't got it running in a on an ES, ESXi server at home. I so I have a lab and I have uh, some some ESX at home as well. Uh, but like for home, I wanted to use because. Um, I have like full, you know, I don't have a firewall at home. I'm, I'm that kind of guy. I live like, I like to live dangerously. <laughs> so I have everything open to, to AWS. So I thought for my home, AWS was, was the best. And it gives me some AWS experience, which I really didn't have until Cisco started using using it and deploying a controller in, in AWS. So that at least gives me some AWS exposure. Uh, now for my lab, I actually have uh, a gaming PC, which like many of my colleagues are refurbished as gaming PC at night and then uh, lab uh, during the day. Mm -hmm. So I just added some RAM and, and you know, I'm good to go. Uh, so I have uh, VMware on it. I have some ICE, I have a 9800. Um, I actually have a physical uh, 3560 switch, of course, because you're gonna need a switch to power the APs, right? So it's a PoE plus switch, compact eight port. That's just perfect. No noise, nothing, it's, it's just perfect. Um, and I have a couple of APs. I have a 2800, a 9115, and a 9120. Apparently. So the idea is, is really to be able to do, you know, simple configs, uh, not to have all the Cisco APs at home to do all our labs at home. It's not the purpose. The purpose is that it's easier, you know, you can test with your phone, you can test with your laptop. Uh, it's just faster. It's just more convenient for everyone uh, to have just a couple of APs for config testing. Um, when we have to do more complex labs, we obviously still do it in the in the Cisco lab. That's that's the place we we do it. But then it has to be remote, and for wireless, uh, remote is not always easy, right? We don't have uh, remote controlled roaming devices. We, like we we try to build you know a, a RC car and have Wi-Fi roaming, but uh, we never got to to finish it. <laughs> that's actually that's the conversation we have with my manager now. Uh, how do we? How do we demo RTLS in Natalik showcase <laughs> remotely, especially? So I think we might get it somewhere soon with the RC cars and stuff. Let's see if we have it. I will. I will let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to just come by and, and use it. So uh, RTLS for us. I, I really loved all your RTLS episodes because RTLS is a topic I, I I digged into, but it's usually a topic engineers do not like here because it's not easy to to showcase at least in our lab. So we have a gigantic lab with, you know, every team has every device in there, but the wireless team just has like one or two rack space and all your APs stacked in one or two rack space that just doesn't fly for, for wireless, right? At least for location tracking, like just just forget it. Um, so what we do is we, we use our office space and we have APs like on the desk at the extremities. We try to do like a triangle and, and we do location uh, tracking inside that triangle between our desk and that kind of works uh, pretty okay. But obviously, it, it's like it's upsetting our colleagues that we we do labs in a, in our floor area. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so <laughs> sounds like it's a bit of a challenge then when it comes to the labs. How hard would you say is the uh, CCIE wireless lab? Um, CCIE is always hard. Like I'm not gonna lie, right? I failed it four times, so I got it on my fifth attempt, um, which I'm I'm not ashamed to say because. It doesn't show anywhere, right? I have the CCA number and no one knows that it took me four or five attempts. But, well, it, but it, I'm afraid to say they do now. <laughs> <laughs> the secret's out. But I'm... still, that's the, it's amazing that you passed because I've got other friends and colleagues that have done the CCIE wireless lab and they yeah. said how, how hard it is. So The reason I see it is because I have colleagues which I'm sure are capable of it and they did uh, one attempt. The second attempt was like really close. They had like more or less like 70% and you need 80 something. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, you can make it, you know, just study once more. And, and they just gave up and they're like, oh, I'll, I'll do it next year. But then, you know, next year it's another version, another uh, new features. And, and mm. then you not saying you have to start from scratch, but you need, you know, a bigger effort. And it's the way I did it, uh, my first attempt, I got around like 20% or something. Like it was really miserable. Uh -huh. I failed like big time. Uh, and I'm like, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'll try it as, you know, until I get it. Until I pass it, because anyway, the benefits you get out of it, it costs a lot of money, right? For me, I have I had three attempts uh, expensed by by the company, uh, but I thought to myself, even if I have to go, and I, I did, I took five attempts, right? If I have to go further and pay for it myself, 
I'll do it because it's, it's worth it. So it's going to be reimbursed uh, at some point or another. Exactly. But it's very difficult to find a motivation after a few failed attempts for most of the people I know. Right. It's like you're trying your hardest and then you can't pass, you can't pass, you can't pass. Then you think, oh, yeah, I need a break. And then it's extremely difficult to come back into. Study. Exactly. The break is, is what you should not do. In my mm. opinion, it's hard, but it's what yeah. you should not do. Yeah. It's what I do for everything. I just book it and then I have to, you know, I have to study and go for it. Yeah. Same thing for sport. I'm a non sports guy, but I thought to myself, you know what? I would like to run a half marathon. So I booked it and, you know, I kind of had to start running for it. So if I don't do that, I'll, I'll never do anything. So it's, it's my way to get out of my comfort zone. Exactly. I always found when it came when I was studying for exams, the best thing is momentum. So just, you know, get to find like a study pattern that you're going to do, like wake up an hour, two hours earlier, get your studying done in the, in the morning before everyone else gets up, get out of the way or, you know, book some like during your lunch break, you're going to study for half hour and just actually know when you're going to be doing it rather than just say, oh, maybe I'll do it here. Maybe I'll do it there. And then you end up procrastinating and then you put it off and then it doesn't happen. So yeah mad well maybe one day we'll go for our our ccies mac maybe one day maybe one day um okay let's uh let's move on to something else and maybe um maybe you can talk to us about some interesting cases that you've come across in 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 the tech world um yeah there's there's a, a lot of ones uh some actually it's extremely rare but i have been on site um so for me it's it's really a a great experience because I, I rarely go on site. I'm not supposed to, uh, but uh, remotely some interesting cases. And, and that's the great part is that you don't need to travel to see, you know, amazing situations. And at first my family is like, Hey, what'd you do? Like, yeah, Wi-Fi for enterprise. And yeah, it's just office space. And yeah, people have Wi-Fi. It's not interesting. Then I started to tell them, oh, you know, I had a really interesting case. Like I had a supermarket and, you know, now in a supermarket, you have those self scanners that you can just scan your, your groceries yourself. Um, and some of them, they are connected via Wi-Fi to get some, some promotions or just live connections. Some, I know some are not, but some, some are, and then you don't think about it, but at the beginning of the supermarket, there's just like a rack with all of those scanners there. And when that supermarket company made the POC, they had a somewhat small supermarket with a hundred scanners and it worked flawlessly. Then they deployed it on a bigger supermarket where they had 350 scanners that were all you know parked at the entrance and of course then that's a bit too many uh, scanners on the same access point and that that wouldn't work so that's something they didn't plan in the design and and i thought it was interesting to you know like your design is only as good as as what you think about and if there's a use case you don't think about um that that's gonna get you um i have a memory of a royal family so I'm not going to say uh, which one for a privacy reason. It's not the English royal family, so let's let's put that out of the no. table. It's very interesting uh, one. They had a house, which, I mean, they call it the house. I call it a mansion or a castle, or I don't know how you call it, but it, it's a very big house. And they have uh, Wi-Fi phones in it because you do not get cell coverage, right? Um, my house is not a big one, but I know because I have insulation actually in the walls that block a uh, cell phone signal. I had to have perfect Wi-Fi indoor, otherwise I cannot use my cell phone. Uh, but they have that issue because they have walls like, you know, one meter thick. Uh, it's a really ancient castle, old stones, and no matter what antenna you're going to put, that signal is not going out of the room. Uh, so we ask for pictures because, you know, we're, we don't do really designs or, or, or deployments, but, you know, we try to help and see if we can tweak settings. Um, and it, it, it was massive. Like you have a pool table room and just with a pool table in the middle. And it was like painting on the walls, like, just like you can think of, you know, like maybe French castles or, or stuff like that. Um, so really amazing. And we asked, okay, but I don't see the access point. Like, where is it? Oh, you know, we cannot put the APs in the middle of the ceiling. Like you, you know, you guys recommended. So the APs under the pool table in that room and that other room, we actually hid it in the corner there in the closet. So it's like suboptimal deployment if you could call it like that so, really suboptimal so surprising that it doesn't work i mean what, exactly you know who would have thought <laughs> <laughs> and uh the issue they had there with the phone and they were using cisco 8821s and that's actually a classic uh, with voice over wi-fi uh the phone scans every every now and then and for the 8821 it's every two seconds it's going to scan four channels two dfs and two non-dfs and it's going to take typically two to four seconds to detect a new access point, right? But it depends on which channel it is. So using DFS channels will make it a bit slower. Second thing, if you actually walk out of a room and the phone didn't have the, the AP from the other room from the corridor inside before, 
it's not in the roaming candidate list, right? So you move out, you suddenly have no signal from your previous AP, and you need to wait a few seconds for the phone to scan and actually uh, hit the channel where, where the new AP is. So that's something uh, you really cannot avoid unless you put APs in the junctions, in the corridors, like in the doors and, and, and so on. So it was uh, hard to get to a satisfactory solution there just because of the, the fact that it was a castle and you know they're not gonna drill holes everywhere. Um, work group bridges, also something that is, is quite popular in, in some regions. Uh, we had cable cars in China. So the way I'm used to cable cars is uh, the French Alps, you go to the mountain and you know you take a cable car to go up the mountain. Um, but there in China, they had cable cars between buildings. So it's like a city tour and you have cable cars between the building and some even going through the middle of a building, which I found was amazing. And they wanted to get Wi-Fi inside those cable cars. And that happens with an access point that is put uh, on the cable car. And then there's the, the relay. So you have like the uh, an AP to cover the inside of the cabin. And then you have the, the client, the worker bridge on, on the bottom of the cabin. And the issue was that when you go around a building, right, you were losing signal. So we had discussions about how to, to plug antennas. And it gets really, really tricky. Um, another example of exactly the same problem was a haven, like a, a sea haven, like a port. I don't know what's the proper name. Uh, so they have those kind of open air, I would say, open sky warehouses. They just pile up containers, right, when, when the dockers uh, remove them from the ships. So you had trucks driving between those container uh, lines, and they had to have constant Wi-Fi coverage. And they said it actually works pretty fine, except when we make a U-turn. So I don't know if they were doing handbrake U-turns or, you know, how does a U-turn look like on that truck? Uh, but that was like, you know, first a bit puzzling. So we asked for pictures. And actually they were using, um, I think back then it was a 1260 antenna. So there was four antenna connectors. And um, they actually plugged four separate antennas, uh, directional ones, but with only one antenna uh, cable to each. One was pointing at the back of the truck, one was pointing on the left, one on the right, and one in the front. So they thought it you know, would cover all around the truck. It actually seemed like a smart idea at some point to some people, but the MIMO algorithm just doesn't work that way. Like you cannot have different coverage areas uh, for each antenna. So if, if the truck suddenly uses one antenna and the other, you have like different neighbors and it's just not gonna fly. So we had to say like, go for Omni guys, like please. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever had someone says, scrap the directionals and go for Omni. Not normally it goes the other way around. Well, if you have to do handbrake turns with a truck, then apparently you do. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you resolve the issues like in uh, in this castle stuff? Never resolved fully? Like, uh, resolved? Never fully resolved because the, the proper solution is to, to do a proper design with Wi-Fi as a priority. But there the priority was keeping the walls intact and... and the aesthetics, right? And if that is your priority, then you have to live with a subpar, um, uh, subpar design. Uh, the actual workaround we have is simply do not use DFS channels at all. Uh, and then the phone only scans four channels, so you have only up to two seconds gap, uh, between zero and two seconds, depending on, on the race condition. Uh, best, best than that, we, we, we just can't. Yeah, so the hint here is for this voice communications to use the neighbor list, right? Uh, 11K, exactly. Yeah. Unfortunately, the 8821 does not support that, but the new, they released just now uh, the new WebEx wireless phones. Uh, so it's the successor to the 8821 and it does support 11K, so it, it will solve that problem. And also um, on DFS channels versus non-DFS channels, there is a limitations where the device cannot probe on DFS channels, right? That's what makes it slower. They have to wait for a beacon. Exactly, mm -hmm. so it has to spend 100 milliseconds uh, on that channel to wait for a beacon. Um, so that, that causes actually issues with uh, with reception of traffic on, on your current channel because every two seconds you have to spend 200 milliseconds outside of your channel, so it's not uh, it's not really optimal for voice traffic. Also, in a castle, probably you don't have issues with CCI and massive overutilization of a Wi-Fi network. Exactly, like APs just don't see each other. They just don't. Yeah. So even if you had 50 access points with one meter thick concrete, you could have an AP in every room on a, on the same channel and probably not even have CCI. Yeah, so actually that's that's one of the things. I had also a very interesting case in a, in a metro in Italy. Uh, it was over 10 years ago. So back then self-driving metro train was uh, just bleeding edge. It was crazy. 
so the first self-driving metro I heard about. So they needed to have Wi-Fi constantly to the to the cars, and they did a really good design. They had one uh, Wi-Fi router. They used an industrial one at the front in the, the front car, and one at the back. So that, you know, when there's a turn or some weird junctions, there's probably always one of the two sides of the, the the train that has Wi-Fi connectivity. And it worked pretty good, except uh, they had some roaming delays. And by safety laws, uh, if you have more than 0.5 seconds uh, interruption of, of Wi-Fi service, they had to pull on the emergency brake. That's something I heard with a lot of self-driving uh, cars and, and things. So it worked mostly fine, but you know, a few times during the day, the emergency brake being pulled, uh, people don't like it in a city. <laughs> Wait, wakes, uh, wakes them up a little bit. Sorry? Wakes them up a little bit when the emergency yeah. brake goes on. Yeah. Uh, so the idea was that, you know, you're in a tunnel underground. Uh, why do you care that APs are on the same channel or not? So we used 2.4 gigahertz just for the coverage, for the range that they needed. Um, and we said, okay, let's just put all the APs on the same channel. And because it was a, a Cisco worker bridge they had as a client, we could lock the scanning algorithm to only have one channel. So it never had to go off channel to scan and would simply just probe on the current channel and then could keep sending and receiving traffic. And it was like just perfect roaming. So that was a non-intuitive solution that just worked great. Yeah, and that actually makes quite a lot of sense. Probably wouldn't fly in a carpeted open space office in not central London, but yeah. No, <laughs> Why those, not? those things don't exist anymore anyway. Yeah, man. When was the last time you went into the office and seen other people, guys? <laughs> Uh, this time last year, maybe? Oh, no, actually before that. It was January 2020, last time I was in the uh, Netedic office and there's people there. Oh, you were there to collect some equipment, I think. Yeah, I, well, was, I, was, I went there the other week to pick up some Meraki cameras, but there was no one there. It was literally just no one in the office. One security guy on reception let me in, grabbed the box, and I left. London was empty. But we were, well, speaking of being on site then, uh, Nick, Nico, you mentioned that you have uh, you very rarely go on site, but I suppose some of the sites that you go on, it must be quite a... Uh, a large escalation to get Cisco tax finest wireless engineer there. So what are some of these sites that you've been to? Exactly. So there, there are basically two reasons. If it's really close, that, that's one factor. But then even if it's not, then if it's a big enough escalation, it, it will happen. So we, we need to send someone on site, the best resource. And if it happens to be the tech engineer that, that is familiar, then it, it just happens. So, um, so, I, so Cisco tech engineer, but also you, there's, is it Cisco advanced services where you, yes. Get so advanced services are the consulting engineers and it's, it's their full, full day time job to actually go on site to customers and they do designs. They're the one doing the, the designs. But here, when we talk about escalation, it's typically a troubleshooting, uh, action plan you have to, to collect. Um, so they might be less, uh, comfortable with that. On the other hand, the tech engineers know a lot about troubleshooting reading the logs, but not necessarily about how to collect, right? Because tech engineer doesn't have to collect wireless sniffer traces in synchronization with a wired sniffer trace uh, with time sync on everything. That That's something we we ask people, but we don't do it ourselves. And it just actually, uh, you know, it, it brings you some um, perspective when you have to put your own action plan in place and you realize how hard it is and, you know, the pain that you put customers through, uh, it, it it's an eye-opening experience. So after my first on-site visit, I told every new hire we had, like, when you send an action plan to the customer, think about doing it yourself and how much time it would take you and, you know, have some some perspective, some tolerance. Uh, so I think that that's really important, yeah. Um, the very first one was an all wireless office, which uh, was in 2008, I think. So it was, again, bleeding edge, like people, yo, you're not going to have a cable, you're crazy. Now it's just business as usual, right? But back then, 11N was just uh, coming out and it was just um, totally bleeding edge. Uh, and, and no, it's Amsterdam, Nico. So, you know, you, you can go on site. I'm like, you're, you're kidding. I'm 23. You know, uh, I was like junior in the team and no, no, it's fine. You, you'll do fine. Um, so that's when I started to have some perspective on, on AP placement, because it was really, um, not exactly a skyscraper, but a, a really tall building. And the question was where to place APs, um, on each floor. Like, do you place them at the same location and the floor below, providing the, the floor plan and the requirements are the same? Or do you try to, you know, um, salt and pepper them, like spread them a bit around? And um, it was like design questions I, I, I just never thought about because I, I had never used the Kahao or anything and I was I was completely clueless. So I just went by, you know, what worked best. And actually we, we just tried it. We just did you know, a trial by error. So we changed a few APs and I was going around taking sniffer captures, 
uh, using the, the, the site survey feature on my Mac to see the RSSI of, of each APs and seeing what, what worked best. Um, so that was an easy one, the, the, the first one I went. Uh, then I had somehow, I don't know why, but uh, I had a thing for uh, voice over Wi-Fi issues. So there was Norway, literally in the middle of nowhere. Um, they just dropped me there. Uh, so Norwegian people are awesome, but With I, would have, I would have to say they, they don't have the same schedule as Belgian people. So when I went for lunch at 12 sharp, uh, those guys had already finished lunch and, and it was closed. Uh, because somehow they had lunch before. And it was like um, a supermarket warehouse in the middle of really nowhere. And, uh, you know, Cisco employees just dropped me there. Uh, the salespeople, are, oh, Nico, here's the customer, you know, you just go and fix it. And again, I was like left alone and, you know, okay, I have to fix it. I have like one week on site and, you know, just fix it. it it's your job, right? So it's, it was a bit stressful in, when it's your first time. After a while, you, you get used. Um and it's it's always the same thing with a uh, voice over Wi-Fi. So it's it's really discovering new APs. Uh, and those warehouses, to me, the trick is you have an indoor area, like an office space, and then you have like a production warehouse uh, kind of area. And sometimes you have stairs. Uh, so people do walking paths that are not uh, necessarily thought in, in the design. Um, if you walk in an open area, it's fine, but then, you know, walking from one aisle to another, making it like, oh, say a sharp U-turn, it's, it's typically places where you would lose connectivity because you don't have a, a good AP or the phone takes a bit of time to roam and that's that's where the catch is. Um, or some people, you have like stairs and it, it leads to offices that are a bit elevated, like on the first floor or something, and then suddenly they're because of the office walls and you don't get any of the AP signal that you were having before, et cetera. So 11K, that's, that's the solution to everything there. Uh, but I would say also using you have to use DFS channels at some point because otherwise you have only four channels. So I'm a big fan of using the DFS channels, but putting statically the APs that are in the junctions there, the closest AP on a non-DFS channel. So the, the first AP of the indoor office area and the first AP when you go out on a 36 to, to 48 channel, it increases the chance that the phone is going to pick it up very quickly. That's a nice so, little tip there. Yeah. So the so, tip is to get the access point statically on a non-DFS channels in a junction where typically a client wouldn't have enough time to scan for a better alternative and when the call will drop off pretty much. Exactly. So in the heated arguments of, you know, do you go RRM or do you go static channels? I don't have an opinion, whatever works for people, right? I'm not going to pick a fight, but uh, whatever you do, uh, th those junctions are best on a non-DFS channel, that's for sure. And it's not necessarily junction. We have the same in hospitals. You have like shielded doors in, in some places between services, between wings, uh, et cetera. And, and then you just go across the shielded door and for the phone, it's like a brand new environment and it needs to scan everything all over again. So yeah, that really makes sense, man. And also I think you went to do some Olympics stuff. Okay. Yeah. So actually that was uh, two experience, the London ones in 2012. And that was, that was actually not on site. So in London, there was a team on site, but uh, the London Olympics had a lot of deployment across the city. So they covered the underground and, and a lot of... Um, it was like a temporary staff, wasn't it? It's like you were catering for the massively increased number of users. What temporary, but, but they left it afterwards, I think, in a lot of places in the city. All of it. Yeah, so we, we kept working with them with, with that deployment for the, the, the years after because they, they kept using it. So it was a really intense deployment and they were doing location tracking and, and they really tried to, to take the max out of it. Um, in Rio, it was different. I was on site, so they were asking for, for a lot of people to be there to, to make sure it was a success. And there, actually, it was a pleasure because everything worked smoothly. So I don't know, the, the preparation and design team, they, they have to be doing an awesome job because everything just worked fine. Uh, just just one or two tiny minor issues so just to keep myself a little bit busy. But most of the time was enjoying uh, enjoying the, the city of Rio. So that, that was a great memory for me. It's a little bit like Cisco Live events, I suppose. The amount of uh, you know time and planning that goes into designing them. I always see the temporary access points up with you know multiple uh, antennas coming out of them. So you know that you know someone's doing a, a good design there and a good job. So um, I suppose, Jeff, you had to you know support any Cisco Live events. Yeah, so Cisco Live is very different. I'm in the the NOC team there since three or four years. Uh, I've been doing some Cisco Live events as as a tech engineer in the design clinic, etc. Before, uh, but I'm I'm part of the NOC team setting up the Wi-Fi since three or four years. I, I can't recall. Uh, 
uh, of course, this, this year, not going to happen. Um, so the, the team they are doing the design is, is amazing. It, they take the top, uh, like the top gun sales people, uh, the SEs, and they each have like one hole. It's their responsibility and they have to do the best design. So we know the facility in advance. So they have the plans. They can go visit sometimes in advance. Uh, so there's some preparation work. But everything has to be done within, I would say, four days. We, we basically land on, on the Wednesday before the event. And on Sunday, people are coming to register and it has to be live and working. So that's the insane part. It's a lot of hours, uh, basically 14 hours a day, typically, uh, just to put all the APs. So we have a bunch of, of typically juniors and new hires uh, that are really happy to, to help. Uh, but you need people to, to just coordinate them because you have the people pulling up the lighting, all the, the decoration, etc. And you cannot just go put your APs yourself, right? You need to borrow someone's um, forklifter, uh, scissor car, I don't know how you call it. Mm. So you need a lot of coordination just to know when you can put the APs on the rigs and then when the rigs are going to be up. And then the rigs are up and you realize, oh, we forgot to plug the switch, so they're, they're not powered. Uh, so any mistake costs you like one hour and, and, and just bothering everyone. So it's just time extremely time. difficult. And I'm not part of that physical deployment. Much better guys are, are doing that with me. I'm behind the controller, making sure everything comes up, setting the configuration and just hiding behind the controller. I think, did I see at the, uh, the last Cisco Live as well, um, there was open roaming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that the first Cisco Live event with open roaming? Uh, yes, so it was Barcelona 2020, I think was the first, yeah. They yeah. did in the US. Uh, uh, no, 2020 in the US, it was already virtual. Um, so I think they, they tried open roaming in, in uh, the US in 2019 already. And then in Barcelona in 2020. And in how- Barcelona, it was fully integrated with the Cisco Live app. So just having the Cisco Live app, you would auto connect to the Open Roaming SSID. Yeah, just install the profile on your phone, and then when you turned up, you just connected, and it all worked okay. How how was it from the you know the support side? Did you have any issues or any weird bugs that you needed to iron out or? None whatsoever. Just worked flawlessly. So it was it was really a, a piece of cake, to be honest. It's even easier, right? You don't have to download manually any profiles, anything. You just install the Open Roaming app. It just been released like a few weeks ago, I think, and it just works. Yeah, and something people ask about privacy, on the controller, you do not see people username. So you're going to see a, a kind of hash at the, the provider, so you can still see the provider people pick to, to identify themselves, uh, but you don't see the username. It's it's like a hash. So you can uniquely identify like someone, but it's like a random Mac. Like, yes, he's going to keep that username when he's connected, but you, you just can't figure out who it is. So only the identity provider would know who connected. Yeah, that's the future, man. The, We're uh, all waiting for the broader adoption from all the vendors around. Not everyone is doing it, unfortunately, yet. Yes. There we yeah, go. The, the, the new app just got released. Yes, oh, now there's an open roaming gonna, app for I'm iPhones. I'm going to install it's it, not, actually. It's not integrated in the iPhones, right? Samsung phones have it by default, but uh, you need an app on, on iPhones for now. Yeah, we'll so see. if you just go to the App Store and then just search open roaming, you'll find the, uh, the Cisco app and you can set up open roaming. Nice. Yeah, I think that. Matt will have to focus on it a little bit more, the open roaming idea and implement it at our houses and Natalie Coffee. Because we've had it up and running in our houses and at Natalie Coffee. But since then, we have changed the equipment, access points, controllers like, you know, 20 million times. Yeah. So have to go for it again. Yeah. What, uh, what really makes me happy about open roaming is that it's, it's one time you set up the profile and then it's going to work everywhere where there's someone having open roaming. So you don't have to worry about even connecting to the network. Uh, that said, there's actually an SDK available for typically retails that want to uh, tie it to their app. So you may want to say, I only allow on my open roaming SSID people using my identity provider with their loyalty card to make sure they use the loyalty card and, and you know tr- track their activity a bit more, to be honest. Uh, so there's still that part of people where you can have open roaming, but you could not necessarily connect with your Apple ID or any other Apple ID than the store. Uh, ID, ID. So yeah, just, that, that's something to keep in mind. Just signed in with my uh, my Google account and I'm all set up and ready to go. It's just as easy as that. Now I've got my device set up. Yeah. We well done. Yeah. Nice. Oh, sorry, I sidetracked a little bit there. But yeah, open rooming is a very cool concept. I like it a lot and um, I think it's definitely needed. So, you know. But we've, uh, we've, I think we focused on that on another podcast previously. So let's, let's focus more on you, Nico. It's all about you today. 
So um, that's, Ooh, that's I, feel, some... I feel weird now. <laughs> um, so that was some of the cool on-site stuffs that you have been involved in. But obviously, working in tech, you must have come across some uh, some interesting bugs. Anything you want to share? Maybe like going. You mentioned going through logs earlier. Like you know, you, you know, yeah. appreciate how hard it is to collect some of these logs whilst on site. But you know, reviewing millions and millions of lines of logs. Like, how do you guys even do that? Do you use like Notepad plus plus or like to compare or what? What, what, what do you? Step one, yes. Instead <laughs> of using Notepad, you move to Notepad plus plus. That's like day one on the job. Yes. <laughs> Um, I, I would say that actually answers the, the the question of, you know, oh, 14 years in tech, like, how are you not going crazy? Like, how is it not boring? Because I hear a lot of people, oh, 14 years, the same job, like, you know, it's time to change. And I'm like, well, every day is, is a new day for me here. So I'm I'm learning like like still on the first day. So I don't see, I mean, there, there have been people who move away from tech to other job because they want to try sales, of course, right? There's always other opportunities. But uh, boring, it, it never got a single day boring. Um, I, I'll explain why, because you asked, so how do you get through logs? So originally, I started in 2007. Uh, it was all manual, right? So you open the log files with Notepad++ uh, and, and you try to look for you know, uh, stuff you know. And we had uh, out the internal tricks and how to, like, oh, for that product, uh, to track an authentication, go check in that file, and then you're going to see which device authenticated when, and then uh, you can see in that other file what happened, etc. So it was all very manual, and we just had like trainings: look for this, look for that. Um, so people ask, oh, you know, do you understand every line of of the debugs? No, no, we just don't. We know a few lines that are important, and you know the lines that mean there's a problem. A lot of lines we just have no idea what they mean, right? So it's not like you have to study a dictionary of what every log line means. That just doesn't happen. Um, on that topic, we actually have access to the source code of every Cisco product. So if there's an error message you're not comfortable with, you can actually check the source code and uh, check what, when it's triggered and what is it, its meaning and the comments in the code and, and so on. So that's also something empowering that we we can leverage uh, programming skills if we have some uh, to 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 have better uh, a better experience at work. Uh, so that's that's the old times. So we very quickly said we need to automate this, right? Uh, even before programmability and automation were were cool, we're like we need something here. So people started to make small apps, uh, scripts when Python was was the thing, uh, to go through through logs through through things. So we have scripts that uh, go through debugs and tell you the history of events. At this timestamp, the client connected. At this timestamp, the client got kicked out. At this timestamp, this happened. There was a roaming. Uh, so it just helps you give, you know, a, a kind of history of what happened. Like, oh, this client, for example, in a successful case, it connected and then nothing. It just passed traffic for two hours. Great. There doesn't seem to be a problem. Or, oh, this client every two minutes is getting kicked out and then has to reconnect again. That's fishy. I need to check this uh, this part in the logs. So that's that's how we, we do it typically. Uh, but we, we don't have that for everything because we kind of need to catch up, right? There's new products, new ways of of writing logs. So we're, we're just, um, it's like a... A second job, we, we code our own tools to to have a, an easier job. So that's that's something tech engineers with more programming skills will, will try to do that. Uh, then some tech guys came up with an engine to automate all of that. Uh, we, we call it Borg. Um, so every Python script that we have in a central repository, it has a specific purpose. It parses a show tech, it parses a, a debug output. And then that engine identify the type of file that the customer uploads to the case oh, that seems like a router show tech. Let me trigger all the Python scripts that parse uh, a router show tech. And then it, it runs all those scripts and gives the output to the tech engineer. So what does that mean is that nowadays, if you upload a show run config from AirOS controller or a show tech wireless from an IT800, we have within minutes, uh, as soon as you uploaded it, a, a summary. Uh, there's probably insufficient coverage there. Watch out, this config is not matching the best practices. Um, so really like config analysis, but more than just the config because those show tech wireless and, and show run config in AirOS have like, you know, AP power levels and, and you have like a lot more. So you can detect a stock AP if there's an AP with 200 clients and something, you know, doesn't look right. Or an AP that does not see any other neighbor, uh, that's, it could be justified if it's in a fridge or some special place, but it uh, could be a sign of a problem as well. So we have a lot of heads up and we're like, okay, let's check this, let's check that. This is relevant to me and, and so on. So that's that's our big main engine. It's quite fascinating, man. And where are you when it comes to developing the parsing tools for the Catalyst? 
those ROS, you probably nailed that, right? You had a yep. long time to nail the platform, but now it's pretty much dead. So how advanced are you with the 9800 and your team is? Is it more difficult for you to iron out the issues that your clients have on a newer platform than it used to be on the old one? No, it's it's much easier. So that's a whole other topic. That's why I love the 1900 and I only talk about the 9800 nowadays. It's so much easier. Uh, I actually but, had to look uh, at an ARS controller the other day to help um, one of our customers with some of their config. And I was trying to remember, oh, God, I haven't seen an ARS controller for ages. All I've been working on is 9800s for the last, I don't know, a year, 18, two, 18 months, two years. And then, yeah, actually seeing an ARS controller, thinking, oh, I got to remember, no, where do I go to check that again? And then I had to like click around to remember where to go. We're going to see them for years because when it works, people tend to not touch it. So we still have people with 5508s right now running like 8.2, 8.3. So those people, you know, uh, maybe they purchased the 5520, but they haven't used it yet. Uh, I, I know how it goes. So we're going to keep seeing them for, for years to come. So we still develop tools internally to to deal with them. But yeah, the focus is on, on 9800 and also because it's it's a lot more common. I mean, it's the, it's the same iOS than, than switches and routers. So we benefit if there's anything touching crypto and, and platform independent stuff. We benefit from other teams as well. But the serviceability is just much better on the 9800. Not only do you have stored log history, so even without debugging anything, you have a pretty good uh, logging level about everything that happens uh, because the logs are stored in binary. So it's extremely efficient from a CPU perspective, but also from a storing perspective. Super so simple to collect this information as well. You can just go on to like the client, uh, go on to the main part of the controller, the client has got a little spanner next to a client. You hit the spanner and you can say, send this to the logs. And then you look at the log file and yep. you've got on the controller and you can see it straight away so yeah definitely accessing client logs is a lot easier for um on 9800s for debugs and uh seeing all that kind of exactly and, and now the way we're going is is a log bundle because um let me talk about something else briefly first to introduce it so we also have scripts uh, attached to bugs so for every bug we actually have a process where an engineer check if the trigger is really easy to identify some bug is like, yeah, it happens every Monday on a full moon when you raise your hand like that, you know, we cannot. Or when this client is used in a network and this traffic is sent, like we're not going to be able to catch this. But when we have conditions that you can spot in a show tech or you can spot in any log output we have, uh, there's a script attached to the bug. And also every time there's uh, files attached to the case, we check, like, are we hitting that bug? And we try to find really triggers for bugs and, and to to automate them basically. So we have some automatic bug detection on, on the bugs where it's possible. So now our objective is to increase that uh, that amount of bugs where we can automatically identify that, that the customer is hitting them. And the problem we have is really uh, putting together different log files. So right now that engine only works on one log file. Uh, show, works great because Showtech Wireless has a lot of output. But Showtech Wireless doesn't have your client debugs. It doesn't have every detail about every client. There's Showtech Wireless client for that, uh, because otherwise the command would just be too big. So we're going with log bundle now on the 9800, where you could say, hey, this client has been having problems. I want to get the log bundle for it. So it's going to give you a capture on the controller, filtered for that client. Uh, it's going to give you the debugs for that client. It's going to take a Showtech Wireless, but also a Showtech Wireless client of that client, which has all the data plane and control plane entry uh, advanced debugs that we like to, to go and check. Um, so then we can work on those log bundle files and, and be much um, much more easily correlating separate files because we know are it's about the same thing. Are they available now? Or is it something that you plan to introduce? No, we're working on that. <laughs> so you asked before what was available for 9800. Uh, what was popular was the wireless config uh, analyzer, WLCCA, otherwise, uh, that, that existed for a long time for AROS. And now that one is available for, um, for 9800 on the cloud version. So I always prefer the cloud version because it's always updated. Every time we have a change, we update it in our backend. Otherwise, the desktop app is, has to be compiled and it, it's not that, uh, that current. So the desktop app doesn't work with 9800 yet. Uh, the only advantage of the desktop app is, is the more graphical side, but all, all the engine and the smartness is really in the in the cloud version. So we have that already for 1900. It's available in uh, in the developers.cisco.com uh, page. So uh, we, we can put that in the show notes. There's a page with all the tools around 1900 and, and wireless tools in general. We have tools to help migration of the config from AROS to 1900, for example. Um, yeah, that's built into I, the, actually into the 9800, isn't it? So you can just upload the config from an ARS controller into the 9800, yep. and then you can apply that config 
and it it converts automatically yeah and it lets you know uh, those lines will need a change like ip address you know you may want your 1900 to have another ip address uh passwords you need to retype them again uh, so there's a few lines that need your attention and some lines that just don't make any sense anymore in 1900 like the feature doesn't work that way so it tells you these i didn't translate like you know check if you really need them but uh Typically, they're, they're not needed, like you can yeah. discard. They're, but yeah, I mean, we did see that. And I think we went to use it once and maybe it didn't work. And then we actually decided, you know what, for, for our own learning, it's probably better just to configure it from scratch on the 9800 to give us, you know, that experience of actually configuring it for the customer. It's kind of the best way, you know, rather than just taking the config from the ARS and trying to apply it on the 9800. Yep. It may, yeah, yes. maybe it'll do it. Maybe it'll do if it. you can afford it, yes, because uh, the 1900 has a different philosophy where you organize things by site. You have site tags mm -hmm. that you didn't have with AirOS. Uh, so if you automatically migrated from AirOS, it might not be an, an optimal config. So yeah, so that's why we. But sometimes, sometimes you cannot do it manually, right? There's so many APs, so many stuff. It's like, wow, I don't want to touch this. <laughs> yeah, no, that's kind of why. Uh, yeah, we decided in the end that we would just configure it manually ourselves to get our head around it, and then because you get, like you said, you've got to figure out the different sites, different tags, different policies that like you never had that with AirOS before. So, best way is to throw yourself into the deep end and figure it out, right? Yeah. yeah. What we what we do is like we uh, we capture all the configuration. We understand all the configuration from the AirOS. We have like a super nice slick template on our site where we translate that into 9800 ourselves, making the you know policies and tags named the way we want, uh, that it makes sense. And normally, like how much time does a configuration take? Like a half a day, typically, like for like a controller per. Not too yeah. bad, is it? And, and it's the best way to to get into it and understand it. Yeah. Also, the the best way you should do about 1900 is to have regex to to tag your APs. So have the AP names that are meaningful per per site or per purpose, and then have regex to to automatically have the tags mapped to them. So that even if if you change an AP or add one, it's automatically going to get tagged. Um, that's the best way. And, and regex is not something the the migration tool will do. But some people say, oh, but you know my AP host names, they don't really have a meaning. Like they they're not really grouped, and uh, regex is not going to be easy for them. So they just want to have a one to one mapping and the tool can do that, so. Yeah, I always like to configure uh, host names for our customers to identify, you know, what site they're at, what floor they're on, and what AP number, so not just a random host name for uh, access point. And this usually, you know, AP, then the MAC address. See that quite a lot. Makes it hard to identify, you know, where it is. If you're troubleshooting or you're trying to do a survey, figure out where access points are placed, it becomes a bit more of a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And to, to finish on the tool, we, we talked about the debug tool, right? Debug analyzer tool. So there is, there is on that website, on, on the developer website, uh, a tool that goes through AirOS debugs. Uh, so that, that's available to everyone. We have one internally that does 9800 uh, radioactive traces. Uh, it's not yet published. We have to, to finish working on it. So it, it, I think it's going to be pretty cool, but there's still a lot of work uh, to do on it. So it, it's not ready yet for prime time. So you're working on two things that you're going to release to, to us engineers out there. Uh, you will have a parser for uh, the radioactive traces uh, that you can produce for your client when you're troubleshooting connectivity issues on the 9800 controller. And what was the other one? Uh, the log bundle. Yes, yes, log bundle. So that's going to come in, in future IO60 uh, releases. And then we'll, but that's going to be internally. The log bundle analysis is to run our internal scripts. Because there's a lot of things, uh, we have internal scripts because sometimes it's just attracting attention and you're not necessarily matching like a known issue. Like we don't want to freak people out, right? Uh, it's just, hey, watch out, this could be weird, but maybe not. So check it, you know, with the rest of the output yeah. and that we, we still keep for, for tech engineers. So not everything is, is public for that reason. So that will just make working work like a workflow with a tech engineer sleeker, better and faster. It won't be accessible for, for me or my. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. That's fair enough. Okay, no, so we have discussed quite a lot on our list now. I think we have just one last thing that we haven't discussed. So the question is, how stressed are you, Nico? <laughs> uh, now it's, it's it's a little bit more because, um, so as, as you maybe saw on Twitter, I, I signed to write a Catalyst 9800 book. So I, I, I got to it, I started it. I have a few pages already, but okay, I need to, to deliver it by this year. <laughs> yeah, so is it a press book? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be a printed one, a real Cisco press book. Yeah. Wow, amazing. 
Uh, I did the CCA Wireless 3.1 study guide uh, before, but that was an ebook only, so it doesn't have the same satisfaction to it. But on ebook, it has colors, while the printed one is in black and white. So there is always that, and I end up reading it on the Kindle anyway. But you know, to have one of your book on the bookshelf is always also really cool. Uh, we have Cisco Life coming up as well. Uh, so now it's uh, they merged actually the EMEA and the US one. So it's a global Cisco Live event. Actually, even even APAC is, is merged. It's just one Cisco Live for the whole world. And there's going to be uh, breakout sessions that will be uh, basically video on demand. So you're going to have a live event with the main announcement and, and all of the main stuff from the, the big guns in Cisco. And you're going to have all the breakouts published. So that means you do not need to pick which one you will attend. Uh, you can watch all of them when you want in, in the comfort of, of your iPad or, or whatever. Uh, so I have a breakout session there about troubleshooting uh, wireless. And there's the week after that, uh, I would say, main event, there's the labs uh, week. So you have a bunch of hands-on lab. And I'm making a lab with two uh, amazing tech wireless uh, colleagues, Vasily and, and Petar. And it's going to be about guest, uh, guest wireless, like all the shapes of it. Guest wireless with eyes, guest wireless with DNA spaces. Do you want to put encryption keys on your wireless guests? Like, it's just... Uh, Oh, that's going to be interesting. After that, you know just everything about guests. And you, you just pick the solution that works best for you, but uh, you're going to test them all. I would love to attend that, man. It's like, you know, how to tackle the issues introduced by mac randomization and, you know, the guest portals failing more and more. That would be a nice session to attend. Yeah, I think. It's, it's challenging to build remote labs, but we're we're working on it and it's 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 going good. So... Um, okay, yeah. so it's like a quick question here. What is what is the tax answer to to guest workflow now? Is is using a splash page still a good solution? Uh, ideally, no. I prefer not. Uh, if you ask me, uh, enhanced open is the best because you have encryption and privacy, but. Uh, uh, you don't have any page, so it's the, the smoothest experience, but not every device is supported yet, right? So Maybe if you uh, just want to explain what enhanced open is. Yeah, so that's both part of WPA3 and not really part of the WPA3, right? That's good. But it came with the WPA3 features with a lot of vendors, I think. Um, and it's really the having a, an open SSID, so that doesn't ask for any credentials, but it's going to be encrypted. So you have a unique key, and that means anyone hearing uh, your traffic will not be able to decrypt anything out of it. Yeah, and it's transparent, right? So all it takes is just to hit the SSID name and you connect. Exactly. To, you know, the key staff authentication is happening in the background. Yeah. Transparent and that, user. that means everyone has a different key. So that solves the PSK problem without the burden of, of assigning the key to people. So they don't have to type it. Uh, they don't have to, to, I mean, you don't have to manage the keys for everyone. So I think it's it's the best solution. Uh, but for legal reasons, many people, you know, need to give that that warning or that uh... or a tick box. Like I understand terms and conditions exactly. of using this network. That's a little bit challenging now, right? We have like a yeah. workaround where, uh, with Mac randomized devices, we are being sent to a page that shows clients how to disable it in order to continue using the guest workflow as as they normally would. I wonder how is it going to be resolved in the future, and that's quite fascinating. Because like pretty much everyone that we know, on most of people, they are using this workflow for guests. Open roaming to me is another best solution because people are doing .1x, which is even more secure, right? And they still don't have to type any credential, and they don't even have to click on the SSID. So it's even better than any other solution from that aspect to me. But yeah. if you need a splash page just for legal reasons, you're still going to need it. And I think the problem is the, the pop-up detection mechanism. Um, so historically, people started to use HTTPS more and more, right? They had the home page in their browser in HTTPS. And then we had people saying, oh, but I do not get redirected to the login page if my home page is HTTPS. Because HTTPS redirection is very costly for a controller. It takes a lot of CPU resources. And you're going to have a, a certificate warning, even if you install a valid certificate on your controller. Because, I mean, the guy types HTTPS gmail.com. So you expect Google certificate, but you show up even valid, a controller certificate, that's not going to fly, right? It's not Google certificate you're, you're giving. So there is no way to not have a certificate warning if you do HTTPS redirection. So we try to tell people, yeah, but you have to do HTTP and not HTTPS, et cetera. And then most operating system came with their pop-up detection mechanism, right? You have it on iPhone, on Android, now on Windows 10 as well. Uh, so it, it's really working great because that uh, sends a probe in HTTP. 
So the, the captive port is automatically triggered and automatically pops up when uh, when you're on a web both SSID. So on the paper, it works amazing and it solves all the problem. Except in many operating systems, it just doesn't pop up. So I, I saw someone on Twitter recently tweeting that with every iOS version, it gets worse. And I agree, like on my iPhone, uh, sometimes the pop-up just doesn't show up and I need to open the browser and, and type in uh, a URL and I'm not exactly sure why. I but see. yeah. There's a solution coming for that. So there's a standard now for uh, for portal detection that was signed by actually all, all the main vendors. And Apple is probably the first one to, to implement it. Uh, so on DHCP, on a DHCP option, you actually give an API URL where the, the client can ask about its WebOut status and figure out, oh, I'm in WebOut pending or uh, I've been authenticated already. So that even helps after session timeout. The client can figure out if if he needs to authenticate again or not. Nice. Okay, so this will like bypass the authentication based on the MAC address, so you can still have like no traceability on your device and still be presented with a, a with a exactly. splash page terms and conditions. Okay, cool. Exactly. So it, it's so just a, a proper clean way to ask, is there a splash page here? Like, do, what do I need to show? And it gives uh, the true API calls, the, the splash page to the client then can, nice, man. That can show like it. it so do so, we have like an ETA? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to comment on ETAs because I'm not from Cisco marketing or product managers, but I know Cisco is working on it. So uh, I guess we're not the only ones, but I, I think that's going to be the future of, of a proper guest uh, splash page if you need to have one. Yeah, I mean, even, like good options. even recently, I've, just, I've been troubleshooting a, a captive port, intermittent captive portal issue on a Meraki deployment where a customer wanted to use a, a captive portal just to, you know, people to accept some terms and then get online but you know they were saying oh sometimes the devices they see the pop up sometimes the devices don't and then typically when i jumped on a call with him and uh, we went through troubleshooting these different devices it all just worked they all worked and i was like well it's just a thing with captive portals sometimes sometimes you know it's intermittent sometimes devices they do it sometimes there's a uh, an update to the software update to the phone and now they don't uh, make the pop-up come up and it's just yeah it's just a frustrating battle with captive portals so this sounds like it could be a good solution yeah I'm betting on. I'm hoping for it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yeah, same. We need it absolutely. Okay, guys. I have no further questions on my list. But is there anything that you would like to to discuss, Nico, before we close it up? Um, not sure. Not sure. I think uh, we covered uh, we covered pretty much it. Uh, please attend Cisco Live event and and my sessions in particular. Uh, they're gonna be they're gonna be awesome. So please, please. It sounds like it that. might be a good idea to actually record maybe more podcasts or, or shorter videos around the 9800. Uh, so if we have some features that are not too easy to uh, to implement or that are not too well known out there, but they are genuinely useful or something that might help tag getting the better quality logs from the clients. How do you capture these logs? How do you do simultaneous capture of wireless and and wired at the same time? What do you use? Uh, what tools do you use to open these logs? Uh, it might be useful. And uh, I know Nico likes to build some hype around uh, 9800 release features. I saw it when you were releasing day by day new features from 17.1 or something or 17.3. I can't remember which version it was, but you're releasing each day a different feature from the software update. You know, oh, 9800 now has dark mode and all little things like that. They're from my perspective, right? So if you ask Cisco Marketing, you're gonna get really like the, the the marketing features, and I'm like, oh, dark mode. That's to me the coolest one in this release, right? <laughs> Even though by other people's standard it's not, but for me it was. So yeah, dark mode is a necessity, man. It's like everything that doesn't have a dark mode is disappointing. Exactly, me. exactly. And and the developers got it right. So yeah. So let's take this conversation offline. If we can set up something like maybe more periodic to sure. get what's changed, what's you know, what's new, what's available to us. I think that will be useful for all our listeners and all the engineers out there and for, for Cisco as well. So everyone could benefit from that. Definitely, if maybe even integrating some uh, some of the DNAC parts of it, you know, how you integrate 9800 into the DNA center. I don't know if you, do you ever have to work on DNA center, the wireless side of things? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's a specific DNA center team for DNA center specific things. Um, when it comes to the data center database, it's its own, you know, box by itself. But yeah, the wireless integration, we we handle that as well. So it's it's also what I like is that you handle wireless, but then there's so many there's DNA space that is a cloud product, right? We have DNA center, so it's it's something we also handle. Uh, there's SDA on on DNA center. There's non SDA as well, so you can really do a lot of things. Uh, that's yeah, that's a big part of the of the job too. That sounds yeah. like we have another ten episodes to record. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, we'll build out our Cisco series with uh, Nico around 9800s and DNA sensor. I think it'll be quite popular. My pleasure. Mm-hmm. Well, it's done. Yeah, thank you very much for your time today, Nico. All the best for the Cisco live sessions and your 9800 press book. We will definitely attend. If um, if people are listening and want to know how they can sign up to the Cisco live and get onto your event, let, let them know how. Sure, we'll, we'll put that in the show notes, right? I'll give you all the links. Yeah, so, yeah, we'll put the links in the show notes so we can sign up and make sure we attend Nico's event and uh, see his breakout session. But yeah, thank you very much for... The last thing before we close, oh, how okay. can people reach out to you if they have some follow-up questions about what we have discussed in this beautiful show? So the the best would be Twitter. So it's at Darchis Nicholas. Um, I'm going to spell it because it's maybe not obvious to everyone. So it's D-A-R-C-H-I-S and then Nicholas without the H. So N-I-C-O-L-A-S. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much for your time today, Nico. Mac, it was a pleasure as well. Good to see you both. Take it easy and all the best. See you guys soon. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.